Thank you again for joining in our Side by Side today. And we're continuing through our little series, looking with the disciples, especially with Luke, at the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 35 and following is where we are in chapter 24 of Luke. Luke, being the historian that he is, records things in a considerable detail. This is what he says. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marvelling, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Jesus appears again. Now, how many times is this? Well, in the early morning, he appeared to Mary, then to some disciples, Peter in particular, and then to this larger group. The reaction is to startle, unsure of what they are experiencing. Now, when you get something that you've never experienced before in life, someone tells you something, you meet something, you encounter something, you have all sorts of different reactions. And I'm sure that when we think about the disciples, this is, this is new. This is unfamiliar territory to them. They're in a new place. They've never been here. And so maybe we need to be a little bit patient with them and their reaction. And what we see, we see something of the reality of God's world. The world that we live in is a world that uses the word, well, Miracle, but it doesn't really mean the thing that we use, does it? People say, it'll be a miracle if she turns up, or it'll be a miracle if they're not late, or it'll be a miracle, you know, if it's a dry day today, things like this. But they don't really mean miracle as we understand miracle. God, not just breaking into our world, but God actually reversing things in a way. That's miracle. It's not just going with the flow or even just the timing of the flow. That is, that is miraculous, maybe. But true miracle is when it actually reverses things. The world we live in tells us, and they, they say it often over the last 13 months, they follow the science, as that statement has been so clearly the declaration of faith nearly. They follow the science. And in so many things, there's not a thing wrong with following the science. Science means knowledge. But then there are things that we don't know about. There are things that we... They just only know because God has revealed them to us, as he does in Scripture. And so to read this Luke 24 would be, well, impossible to so many because they've already decided that miracles don't happen. Those things are just not possible in their world, in their thinking. So when we talk about the resurrection, they immediately dismiss it. And these accounts would be said, well, somebody's made them up. They're like a story. They're not really true. Hmm. I don't think that's what I read when I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's not what I read when I read my Bible. There is a living testimony. It comes from God's Word. This Holy Spirit gives you that testimony. And, and I say to anybody who's listening this morning, if you are maybe subscribing to a view that the miraculous doesn't happen, go read the Bible with an open mind, not with a prejudged mind. But does it not seem so sad? It feels as if something has captured or taken over people's minds. And that is, I suppose, what is true, isn't it? The scripture says that, that Satan has blinded the minds of people. But then, thank God that God himself opens minds. He says, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? That's what it says in verse 38 there. Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? He calms their, troubles, my, their troubled minds and addresses the doubts in their hearts. Notice that he doesn't condemn them or censure them. Doubts are to be found in the realm of belief, not unbelief. Unbelief doesn't even have room for doubts. Then he says, see my hands and my feet. Touch me. Hands and feet, freshly scarred, clear evidence of Jesus' identity. Use your senses. 
your sense of touch and sight. Jesus has nothing to hide. He's always so open, even when there is still a mixture of marvel and wonder. Too good to be true. As it says, they disbelieved for joy and were marvelling. And then he asked for them, well, have you anything here to eat? I find this one of the most amazing little moments. Have you ever thought about this life-changing moment? Here's the fish recently in the water, a creature like many among the millions, but destined for something special, a special purpose. Talk about detail. No, I'm not trying to establish some theology of fish or anything like that. But the point is that the fish is making something clear to us, something really amazing. Somewhat like the record in John 21, where Jesus has that meal of the breakfast of breakfast in the morning after the heat, they've been out fishing. And then they come ashore and they find this little charcoal uh, breakfast on with bread and fish. Jesus takes this fish and he eats it. He eats it. That's what it says. Verse 43, he took it and he ate it before them. We'll just pause for a moment and think about it. What is your understanding of life after death? What is your understanding about the world that the Lord has prepared for us? Isn't it amazing? Something has clearly changed, but some things have not. What we have here is not a lesser, but a greater. Jesus is seen, he's heard, he's touchable, but in some ways he has become even more. He is already no longer subject to the physical laws because he appears to them and then he disappears from them. So here we see in one day how physical his resurrection has been. Reflecting on this, it makes me ask a few questions. It it certainly introduces into my mind a, a few new thoughts, doesn't it? What can we look forward to? Well, first of all, I think a bigger world, a world that is not bigger necessarily in size and scale, but bigger in the sense of what it contains, a a more enriched world, an expanded world in our minds. You know how whenever you're, if you've ever been in times past, we used to go to look at the holiday brochures and you got a little tiny two-inch photograph to show you what it was like. You know, uh, that was before the internet, so there was no way you could go onto your maps, Google Maps or whatever. You just had to really trust that two-inch size of, of to tell you what, what you could expect for your holiday. And usually it was selectively chosen so that maybe if there was a building site that had emerged nearby in the intervening time, you didn't see it. And it, and it sometimes really was disappointing, really disappointing. And you arrived and, ah, there wasn't a blue sky that day and the sea didn't look blue. It was a bit overcast and... Yeah, the colour just wasn't as sharp as that. But that's not the way it is. When it comes to glory, it's going to be much better. I mean, Scripture says that eye has not heard or ear has not, eye has not seen or ear has not heard, nor has it entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those that love him. So it is a bigger world, but it's also a physical world. Yes, it's spiritual, but it's physical too. That's when Jesus says, touch me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bones. Wow. Touch me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. Verse 39. There's something about this world, isn't it? Physical. That is amazing. Then it's thirdly, it's a continued world. In some ways, there's a continuity from this world as we know it and the one that Jesus is preparing for us. There are a few glimpses of the future given perhaps like a little taste to enhance our faith and expectation. There's a sense in which if the Lord was to describe and tell of that future, we could not really grasp it, I think. It might be like someone trying to explain nuclear fusion to a a very infant child. But in ways, he tells us, in ways that everyone can understand, we get enough. We will recognise We will live on in resurrected and glorified bodies. We can touch. There are senses, it seems here, that have a real place. Touch, sight, hearing, tasting. And well, and are these not the things that are precious? These are the precious things. Take all of those things away and what does life mean? But then add to these the crowning point. We shall be able to use them to engage with the Lord himself. 
just now, they're not very heightened, as it were, with regard to the Lord. But then they will be really sensitized. And we shall be able to employ all our senses to appreciate the Lord. And that's going to make heaven a world of wonder, love, and joy. <laughs>